so people are aware. I think it's going to give you a, this meeting is being recorded notification. Um, welcome to grids meeting number. I don't even know. We're we're hammering away. I guess it's week eleven. I don't know if we started on the first week with a meeting. So maybe the tenth meeting. Let's just say the tenth meeting. We have a very special guest here, Professor John Forrest. Um, he is going to be talking to us about portfolios, uh, resumes, and how to be prepared for the uh, postgraduate life slash internship life of graphic design. Um, I'll let him give himself a, an introduction and, uh, and go away with the, the presentation and uh, just uh, hold your questions till the end. Um, and then uh, we'll have like a Q&A sesh afterwards. Give, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good evening. Um, it's nice to very much, very nice to see you and see your names and hear your voices. Um, I miss you all. I'm not teaching at all this year. Um, so this um, this is a a nice moment for me to be actually be able to talk to you. Um, and I and because of that, I want to say I you know. I want to acknowledge the environment we're currently in. I know this sucks. Um, I know we would much all rather be together, um, but I I think it's important to acknowledge what we have the power to change and what we don't. Um, and that while you would all be rather be in person pushing forward and collaborating and making great things together, um, I want to remind you that you're designers. You're naturally geared towards solving problems. Um, and there's something in us that drives us to seek out what is next. So it's, it's just part of who we are. Um, so the events of this year are gonna permanently alter many aspects of how we function as professionals. Um, a number of large tech companies are moving towards remote working model for the long term. Uh, as young designers, you the normal expectation is that um, you know all the tools, you know all the digital tools, you were up to date because you just came out of school, you know everything on that front. Well now, um, in a way, you're going to be expected to understand how to work in this environment. And so while there, there are a lot of negatives to what we're going through right now, um, the end of last semester and this year is an important training ground for how to collaborate and communicate in this remote working environment. Because once we come out of the other side of all this, there's going to be a lot of different working models. And it's important, I think, for you to pay attention to what you learned from this experience because you can turn that into a positive um, moment within an interview to be able to talk about um, how you adapted to this, how well you, know, you work through this experience. Um, because every, at that point, everyone will have gone through um, this experience in one form or another. And so that shared experience actually is something you can put into your conversations within an interview. Okay, so I'm just trying to point out, as much as this all sucks, um, given the world we're going to be in after all of this, I think it's important for you to pay attention to what is the potential that you can bring into those conversations when you go into interviews. And most likely, the remote working environments are almost always going to be better than Canvas. So um, <laughs> you have that to look forward to. So I didn't uh, really go beyond in, uh, Alan's introduction. So yeah, my name's John Forrest. I'm the chair of the Department of Design. I'm a professor in graphic design. I've been here since 2003 um, and I've been practicing um, some form of design for 20 plus years at this point. Um, I traditionally teach the portfolio class. Um, I have for many years and so what I'm going to try to go through this evening is kind of throw my spiels on all of these areas, the cover letter, resume, portfolio, interview, everything into like, just throw a bunch of stuff out you, okay? Now, Alan, I, I, I wanna respect the, your, um, the format, but if anybody, as we kind of get through each section, if you have questions or I'm gonna be putting out there, do you have questions about particular areas? Then please feel free to chime in. Um, Alan and Burnett, if, if people throw some stuff in the chat, I'm going to try to look at that. But if people throw questions in the chat, if you could help me 
see those in case I miss them. Um, but I wanna make sure I do my best to answer everyone's questions. Um, so, um, overall, what is the purpose of this work? Like, why do we even consider all of this? And the obvious answer, I think, is to get a job, right? Um, but to get a job, what you're doing is you're presenting yourself as a designer to a professional audience or a potential clients. Now, there's, there's, a, there's kind of a gap in there. It's like presenting yourself as a blank designer. You're studying graphic design. Um, but you need to figure out what you're trying to communicate beyond, I am a designer, hire me. Because all of you are different. All of you are different in regards to what you feel like you excel at. You're different in regards to how you want to position yourself within the profession, um, what type of work you want to do. All that is different for every single one of you. And so there is no one answer on that front. You have to think about um, what it, how you want to present yourself um, to this professional world. Now, how do you present yourself? I think the premise of this is your portfolio, right? How do I put together my portfolio and present myself? That is. That's just one part of it. And that's, that's in a way the easiest part because you're doing all this work in your classes, you're doing work as freelance, you're doing work in internships and you're gonna pull all that together. But that's stuff that you're, as a designer, you're solving problems. The harder part is going to be the fact that part of presenting yourself is writing and speaking about yourself, about your process, about your solutions, about your strengths, acknowledging your weaknesses, um, and knowing what your aspirations are. You have to think about what it is that you actually want to do. And you may not have that answer today. You may not have that answer by the time you graduate, but it is something you actually have to think about. What are you putting out into the world there? What your goals, what are you hoping to accomplish other than getting a job? Where do you want to be in five years, right? What does that mean? And I will warn you, I, I want to put this out there, this idea of thinking about Okay, when I graduate, where do I want to be in five years? And a lot of times students will tell me, I want to be an art director, or I want to be a creative director, or I want to be a senior designer. And while there are specific paths within, or I guess milestones usually, based on years of experience within the design profession, um, I think it's more important for you to think about the type of work you want to do and the type of people you want to work with. I think those are more meaningful goals that are going to give you a richer experience and, and allow you to naturally move forward in whatever we traditionally assign progression within a career, okay? Um, now, all material you put out in the world should reflect a high level of craft. And, well, you ask, well, I might not show a physical portfolio. I might not need to for years. What's craft if it's not a physical portfolio? Craft in this context is accuracy and details and thoroughness and pre preparation. There should be no typos whatsoever. Your, your, your grammar should be spot on, your, your um, spelling, there should be no missteps in any written communication you have, whether it's something formal like a cover letter or a resume, but also the email communication that you have. Whatever way that you're communicating with a potential employer, take a moment and reread it. Really think about, read it. For, I mean, everybody has spell check built in the email clients, so on and so forth, but actually read on what you've written because there's stuff that that doesn't catch right really think about what you're saying and how you're saying it um so that that goes through everything that you do really take a moment to step back and check everything before it goes out into the world there's still going to be mistakes there's so many things that happen but just do your due diligence there okay um now before the interview before you even get to that stage you have to prepare um your portfolio and this is different now. I'm gonna, this is a very short history and this is weird because I have to do this like this. This is my portfolio. Here, I'll get closer. See that giant black box that weighs way too much? No, oh, there you go. So that is a very heavy case that, that probably cost about as much as the screw post portfolios do now, um, built by a firm that I don't think exists anymore in New Jersey called Spink and Gabor. Um, it carries 16 by 20 inch boards, right? So I got, yeah, you can hear it click and everything. Um, so in here, I have, yeah, well, you know what? Let me turn this off for just a second. 
Okay. So just a blackboard that you probably had to mount all your stuff back in the day on, right? So I, it's full of that. My portfolio is full of this stuff. And it afforded me the ability to mount pieces at full scale, large to full scale, although this was like a 24 by 36 poster, but allowed me that scale, right? So that's one of the things that gave me. It also, in there, and I'm not gonna pull this up because it'll look, um, here, we'll go to the start of the story instead. Um, so it allowed me actually to build wells um, within multiple pieces of board in which I could pull out a magazine or I could pull out a brochure and have a physical object to give to someone. And there's gonna be ways for you to do that as well. Um, but I wanted to show you, so that's from mid nineties, okay? Ancient times. Um, and we did not have websites. Uh, and some of us, I never did this, but some of my colleagues actually would pack these things up and, and I'm from Ohio, so I should put that in context. So I'm, a, I'm in Northeast Ohio and um, they would pack it up and send it to New York and just hope that it came back in one piece after somebody looked at it or Chicago or California. Oh my goodness, if it came all the way back from, you know, so it was scary, right? Um, but here's the thing, um, outside of those kind of extreme circumstances, a lot of times if I'm interviewing, I'd be lugging this thing around the city and going to an interview and that's the first time anybody saw my work right they called me in for an interview based on my resume or you know based on what school i went to or what they you know somebody that recommended me um but they had never seen my work so it, it served a different purpose back then now because of how prolific the presentation of our work is and how much we share it in advance that isn't then why they're calling you in for an interview. If they're calling you in for an interview, they've already seen your work. They've are, they're already interested, you based, interested in you based on your work. So what's the interview for? Something else entirely, and we'll get to that. But I just wanna point out how dramatically it's changed over the last couple decades as to what a portfolio is, what, where it has its most impact, um, and what the role has changed in your job to present it and talk about it, okay? Now, um, I always get the question, what do I put in there, right? And I used to say, only put in your portfolio work that you're proud of. Um, but that's kind of too vague and subjective. And it's also problematic because most of you, designers in general, are never satisfied with the final outcome, right? There's always something you want to fix after you turn it in or you send it to press if you're doing something for a client or internship. So I think I've, I've thought about this and I think it's better that you recommend, I recommend you only put work in your portfolio that you're able to confidently discuss its strengths while addressing its shortfalls in a positive growth oriented way. Never talk negatively about your work in your portfolio. Yes, you might have misgivings about it. Yes, there might have something that went horribly awry. Those should be turned into stories as to either you learned from them or you've overcome them, or you've, you've taken on more training, or you've, you've gone back and revisited it, whatever the story is, there needs to be a spin on that if it's addressed at all, okay? So I want you to keep that in mind, and I'm gonna say this again, you, you have to, there should never be coming out of your mouth in an interview, um, well, I don't really like this piece, but no, never, ever, right? If you, if you have to lead with that, it simply should not be in there. So that, that hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what I mean by you should be able to constantly talk about a lot of the positives of that piece. And there might be shortcomings in it. Think about how you can spin that into a positive um, point or leave it alone. Um, now, portfolio images um, and descriptions. Here I'm primarily talking about your online portfolio. I will say, unless you are presenting yourself as a um, someone that is heavily into um, web development and that you're trying to highlight your programming skills in addition to UX UI, in addition to your overall graphic design, I think it's perfectly fine for you to use any common content management system out there. Um, use Behance, use Adobe's portfolio, um, you know, WordPress, whatever it is that you want to do, as long as it presents your work in the best possible light. Um, that's the key thing there. Uh, but if you don't, if you're not trying to show off your programming skills, then 
that's a lot of time invested, especially if you don't have the programming skills into something that could be used, some time that could be used for writing or refining how you present your work. Um, now your images. I'm gonna share my screen and start pulling up some samples of things I found that I, I wanna use as a, um, some examples for no particular, oh, I need your help, Alan. It's not letting me share. Should work now. Thank you. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Okay. No. So you have, here, let me do this. Most, I'm going to kind of go back and forth a little bit between analog and, and digital here because I want you to think about when you're preparing your images and you're preparing your writing um, about your work, so on and so forth, that we'll talk about. In theory, you want to be as efficient with your work process as you can. So the images that you set up for your analog portfolio will most likely also be used within your digital portfolio and vice versa. What your digital portfolio gives you is simply more um, the ability to have more volume. So say in your physical portfolio, you show the final solution for a piece. In the digital portfolio, you might more easily be able to show the final solution for a piece, but also show process or more process than maybe you're able to show in your analog portfolio, right? But I want to I want to point something out that I see as a common issue when students start preparing their portfolios. Because the traditional physical portfolio it, these days is this. It's a landscape, screw post, binding portfolio. Um, and I'm not saying in any way, I'm not endorsing this or saying you have to do this. I'm just saying this has been the common form of the portfolio for the last several years. Um, and so you have a limited size here. You have limited scale um, and what you can put in there. And when you're trying to present your work, you because you can't show say a poster at full size you end up doing croppies and showing details which i think is great that's that's a really good idea um but sometimes then when i look at students layouts i see a bunch of this and I, they never show me the actual full piece so i want to remind you that whenever you're going to present your work make sure we see the entire scope of the project make sure we see um, the entire piece, even if we're losing stuff in details, it's perfectly fine. We need to see how it all fits together before we can appreciate these details. Okay. And then as this is an interesting example. So we're going through and I, I actually went through and, and I'm like going through and I'm like, wait a minute, they're showing me the same thing again. No, this is a different colorway for this particular poster. But here I thought was interesting. This is a silk screen. So they're showing the, the breakdown of the color breakdown. Then they show the two side by side. And again, they close up with showing it in its entirety. I'm showing you this specifically um, around the idea that make sure you give us the entire piece before you start breaking it down and giving us details. That applies both in the digital space, but it also applies in the physical space, okay? The other thing to consider um, is, again, this is something that because of scale in the physical portfolio, um, sometimes you can show it, but you can overcome that in the digital portfolio is, so this is an example of a book, right? And in the digital space, this might be the equivalent of what you see in the physical portfolio. I can see that there's typesetting. I can appreciate the rag, understand the overall composition, but in a digital space, I can have a much closer inspection of that, right? So this is where when you considering both, um, the different portfolios play it at each portfolio strength. And, and maybe in the analog, you can't really show as much as you want, but in the digital, you have these opportunities to be able to bring something up and really allow me to see it, right? And again, this goes back to something I want to talk to you about in a minute of, in each piece, what are you actually trying to highlight as well, right? When I look at the details of this, why am I looking at that detail? What am I hoping to get out of that? Am I, am I hoping to see this is the, the dot, you know, texture they used here or the half, the half tone texture they used to get this across. When you do, when you provide details, when you give us these up close shots of your work, 
why is it there? Because when you're talking about it in an interview and you go to point to it, why are you pointing to it? And if you don't have anything to point to, or you don't have a reason to point to it, then all of a sudden you're stuck with this kind of dead air um, in the middle of the interview and you're not sure what to say. Okay. Now um, here, I want to point out here, we have a very straightforward description of what this is. It's a poster, it's subject matter, so on and so forth. And it is, it's fairly straightforward. I don't, I mean, obviously there's not a lot of, there's not a huge conceptual dive here. There's not a tremendous amount of research. This is pulling on nostalgia and an established brand and imagery, right? Now, <coughs> this is where writing starts to come into play um, when you're presenting your work online is talking about what the problem was, what the scope was, what the timeline was, right? Um, showing process. And this is where, as you go through this year, um, and if you're juniors, as you go through this year and next year, um, really hold on to your process. I mean, in, in general, designers are relatively good hoarders, right? Um, the seniors usually, it'll, it's going to take you a good, I usually have seniors tell me the following fall that they just finished cleaning whatever space they used to work in for school out. It usually takes three months to at least pretend to get rid of things. I don't know they actually get rid of things, but they say they do. But while you're going through all this, keep everything. Um, because it's, it's, it's then you can just sift through everything and pick out those key moments where you made specific decisions in your process. And that's what you're showing here. You're not showing everything you did. What are the key moments in which you made discoveries in your process to get you to the final solution? You're giving them breadcrumbs back from, this is where the problem started. And this is a solution I came up with and you can see what they did, right? And then you're showing the different, and this is an example of campaign. So you're showing digital artifacts, you're showing environmental artifacts um, and they're organized accordingly, uh, right? And then we have, you know, cla print collateral, you know, um, you know, different types of merchandise. And then I think this is interesting. And obviously this was a very big project, a lot of collaborators, but it does bring up the issue of group work, okay? Um, I don't know, I mean, with your student work, I'm not sure that it's necessary for you to put all of that in there right now. And I know in Behance, it allows you to reflect multiple owners. And again, I'm not saying that you have to do that with your group projects, but I will say this, and I really want you to take this to heart. You have multiple group projects throughout your time with us. Um, each one is a little different in regards to how that group interacted. So like maybe in, I think 125, right? Mario has you work on the setting up the problem and the research, so on and so forth, but then you create your own solutions to problems, right? And um, the same thing used to happen when I would teach 145. Uh, in Myung's class in, in, your, in 155, incorporate in Advanced Graphic Design 2, you're, you're a group project from beginning to end. There's no separation there, right? You're truly a team. You need to acknowledge what it is you actually did on those projects and never take credit for something you didn't do. And all of your teams need to have this conversation before you graduate or before you present your work. Um, all it takes is for one person to not stick to what you agreed to in regards to who did what for you all to miss out on the job because then someone's not telling the truth. And most design communities are relatively small. Even San Francisco is relatively, it's not small, but it's connected. And so it's very important, the ethics behind this here, where you, you really understand and have that candid conversation with, with each other before you present work externally as to who did what and what their contribution was. Is there any questions on that? Because it's a really important point. I don't have a question, Professor, but I just wanted to point out that for the seniors, we never got our process binders back from Mario for 125. So oh. that's actually quite a bit of information that I was hoping to have, and I was very proud of that project, but through COVID and everything, we are yet to get that back, and I, at this point, most of the class is giving up on that ever happening again. I don't think that... Uh... Well, as the department chair, my initial response is, you're right, you're probably not going to get it back. Um, I mean, by having the same issues with interior architecture, I'm getting requests to come pick up models. And the thing is, I can't have 
40 students come to campus, right? Of course. Um, but it doesn't mean that I can't figure it out. Because I, I do have, we have students coming and checking out equipment for photography. Um, I'm not saying that you'll get it, you'll get it back, um, you know, necessarily in a timely manner, but I can, somebody sent me an email to remind me of that, but I can start that conversation with Mario to see if we can figure something out, uh, maybe for next semester, okay? So. All right, I'll, I'll send you an email. Send me an email so I have that on my radar and, and I'll, I'll start a conversation with Mario on that. All right, thank you. Um, so notice there's, now there's a lot of different approaches to this. So there's very minimal writing here, but it didn't require a lot of writing. Um, but here, and this is an example that I see commonly, and I think it's perfectly fine to present logos like this, where if you have a bunch of logos that aren't necessarily attached to a larger brand or campaign, um, and people will put together logo collections, or maybe these are connected to a, another campaign in that student, in that person's portfolio, um, that might be a reason to let go of a description, right? But in the end, you know, some of these I can, I can guess, you know, these are fairly straightforward um, in regards to what it is representing. But in the end, I don't know why they made the choices they made, right? I don't understand the context of the solution. So I think even if it's a very minimal description, I think it's always important for us to give the audience some kind of context there. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, so I'm gonna come back and see, make sure I, what I missed here. Um, now, your digital portfolio, you have all the volume in the world. You can put up whatever you want, however many pieces you want, and go on forever. Quality over quantity, right? Just really think about what you're putting out there and why you're putting it out there. Um, let's see here. Now, I want to shift gears. I'm going to come back to the portfolio a little bit. We're going to talk about the physical portfolio a little bit more. Um, and that'll tie back to the digital portfolio, but I want to jump into um, the, the application, like you, you putting out your credentials, your resume and your cover letter. But before I do that, I want to just pause and see if there are any questions um, on what we've talked about so far. Is it making sense? Yeah, okay. Oh, good, lots of head nods, that's wonderful. Um, okay, so um, your application, your application these days most likely will be digital in some form, right? Like you're gonna submit a PDF to something um, it, you know, they may still ask to send stuff in physically, uh, but you have to acknowledge that a lot of our communication is going to be digital at this point. Um, I, you know, in the end, really all it changes is how you maybe use paper, right? James is shaking his head. No. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, you know, I always stress within this class, this idea of, um, you know, think about the paper that you use. That's all, a whole other element of communication. But that's kind of been taken away from us to a certain extent. So if you have the opportunity to present your credentials that way, then great. Uh, but if not, let's just accept the fact that a lot of it's digital and focus maybe on the content and how you present that content. So we have the cover letter and we have the resume. Both of these are key examples of your typographic skill. Okay. Like I mentioned, going through those digital portfolio examples, sometimes you can get things to blow up and we can see your typographic skill in the print portfolio. It's not always easy to do that or really do that in a compelling way. So when you send in these two pieces of information, they're really able to scrutinize whether or not you understand kerning, whether or not you understand hierarchy, whether or not you understand how to organize a complex set of information, whether you know how to set a paragraph properly, right? All these things came out in just these two documents, right? So your cover letter, a lot, of, a lot of students are either intimidated or don't want to or struggle with writing a cover letter. There's a few things I want you to keep in mind. It, the purpose is to introduce yourself, right? And outline why you would be valuable to them in the context to the job posting that they've put out there. So it doesn't, I think it's kind of annoying when I see literally the job posting regurgitated to me in a cover letter, right? But it is important for you to acknowledge what's in there and where you fit with that, don't be afraid to hit upon that. That shows that you're doing your research and you understand what it is you're applying for. This is also an opportunity within here where you're, you're kind of outlining why you would be valuable to them. 
is to expand on whatever is in your resume. Your resume is a much more concise document where you're dealing with bullet points or short narratives. Um, your cover letter allows you to expand upon that and outline you know, why you're a good candidate um, in, in a narrative. And then you also have an opportunity to outline why your aspirations align with working with them. Now, I want you to be careful here. It's, you would, this would all be great for me. Like if you hired me, I would get this, 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 and this. Just hire me because I, oh, there you go. Don't do that. Think about where those things align, like what you want to accomplish and how it aligns with the job description or how it aligns with what you see the potential employer offering. But temper that just a bit, okay? It shows that this is a mutual exchange, um, but, it, but you make sure that you're acknowledged in the end that you're there to make their team better. Make sure that there is a beginning and middle and end, um, just like any writing. But I've seen plenty of rough draft cover letters that just stop talking. Make sure you have a conclusion. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I think we would be a great fit, whatever it is, but make sure there's something that wraps that language up and sets them up to want to talk to you, okay? Because again, they've already seen your portfolio. They've already seen it online. Um, you know, or instantly when they get your application, they're going to go look at that portfolio, right? So now you're trying to communicate to them the kind of team member you're going to be. Um, and in the end, the interview and all of this process is, do I want to spend 10 to 14 hours a day with this person, whether that's virtually or in person? So there's a lot of convincing that has to go on here. Um, and, and so it isn't just about your work. Now, um, your resume, you've, you need to be visually consistent in how you present groups of information and how you organize information within those groups. This sounds like typography one, right? That's, that's, that's what we taught you. Um, here, I'm gonna share my screen again. I'm, I'm gonna, I wanna make a point here. Um, where is it? Do not use um, a template that exists out there. If you do, I will fire you as a student. Uh, we train you better than that, but I've seen those pop up in my class and I get super pissed. Do not do that. You know how to design this stuff. That's what you're trained to do. Um, that being said, I see things come out of these though. Even if you're not using the templates, right? I see devices that come out of this and some of them are good and some of them are not so good. And so I want to I want to talk about uh, one of them. I want you to I want you to keep in mind. Um, there is a there the trend for a while it disappeared and came back is uh, a set of um, like like information designer graphs that tells me how much Photoshop you know. Don't do that. You don't know Photoshop. Thomas Knoll doesn't know Photoshop anymore, and he invented the thing. Okay, so if you say you know five out of five of Photoshop, you're full of it. Um, don't do it. <laughs> it's okay. Like you need to represent the tools, um, that you know. Okay. It's, it's, that's okay. Uh, like where's my, oh, I don't know if I still have it in mind. Um, let me see if I still have it in mind and I'll show you mine. Um, let's see. Kind of, no, I don't have it anymore. Um, I have an academic CV now. They call it a CV. They don't call it a resume. We, sorry, like I'm not an academic, but at the end of mine, you know, uh, my practicing one, I would just have the tools that I'm familiar with. Um, the Adobe Creative Suite, whatever that was at the moment. And at the bottom, I would put a number two pencil, right? Um, I just pointing out that there are a wide, wide range of tools that we use and it's okay. You can even break it down to, I have, you know, um, I'm stronger in this and I have intermediate skill in this, but even that sometimes get, gets dangerous, right? Um, simply putting on your resume that you're confident or competent, say in After Effects, or you're competent in something outside of the big three, right? Puts that on the radar and then that becomes part of the interview conversation, right? That you know how to use, you know, 3D modeling tools or what have you. Um, the standard, everybody's going to have Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign, right? Um, some very odd people might have Quark, um, does that still exist? But, but still, like, that's a given. 
when you step outside of that, that's, that's like, okay, I'm going to ask them about that. Um, so keep that in the mind, but don't put giant dials that tells me how much you know Photoshop. Um, now, there's a, there's a certain amount of formality that goes into certain credentials that you present or, or making sure that they're accurate too. You are either going to get a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Graph Design or you're going to get a Bachelor of Science in Graph Design. You are not getting a BA in Graph Design. You are not getting a whatever else people make up every year. Those are the only two options you've got, okay? So make sure you write it out correctly. You can abbreviate it, although I don't really like abbreviating BS in graphic design. Um, I have a BS in graphic design, actually, uh, but, um, but I would spell that one out uh, just for clarification because it's not the most common thing. Um, you, you go to, or you're going to graduate from either Sacramento State or California State University, comma, Sacramento, Sacramento. You don't go to Sac State. You don't go to um, CSU Sacramento. Um, not that like the branding police from Sacramento State are going to come after your resume, uh, but I think simply using those two formal names is something that makes sure everybody recognizes where you've graduated from. Um, I include your, if you went to the community college, include your work there, even if you didn't get your associate's degree, um, include your time there and what it is you studied, if it was preparing for this or if it was just general education, but that's, that's fine. Um, I don't know that you need to include high school uh, unless um, you were had 4.0 in valedictorian or something like that, right? And that's the other thing is I would not include your GPA um, unless um, you received honors. Because, you know, I don't, I don't know if you want to tout a 2.0, right? So um, the other thing to consider on that front is you don't necessarily need to cover the span of time either. Um, usually what, pe what I would advise is put when you graduated, right? Or when, at this point, if you're juniors, you anticipate graduating in May. And seniors, you're anticipating graduating in May, whatever year, right? Or for some of you, you're going to come back for that last semester for that GE class you're avoiding. Maybe you move that date back. Um, but, but just put the date you anticipate graduating or you're going to graduate. You don't need to put the span, unless you do it in some crazy amount of time, which is not possible with us anyway, but, you know, that happens. Now, your experience that you lay out in your resume, be concise, be consistent in how you present your experience. So there's two major ways you can do this. So you've got this position that you had, this job. You either have bullet points of what your responsibilities were, or you build it out into a, a short narrative. But don't go back and forth. Pick, one, pick a lane, one way or the other, okay? Um, I generally advise you put the most recent on top. Same with your education credentials. Whatever credentials, put the most recent on top. Now, how many of you have had experience in either retail or food service? That is valid experience on a resume for a designer. Can anybody tell me why? Interpersonal skills? Yes, you have to deal with people's crap. Um, I learned more about working with clients in the 10 plus years I spent in retail than I did in design school or working for a design firm. Um, learning how to deal with difficult people, and I'm not trying to say all clients are horrible beasts that, that you know, they, they, they pay the bills. So um, they should be your partners in collaboration and helping solve their problems. But there are going to be difficult people out there. Um, there are going to be difficult people within your firms that you're working for or with, um, and so all of that is relevant um, experience. And so how do you characterize that? Interpersonal skills, had to, like, I've seen some descriptions of, you know, servers or um, folks running in front of the house that talk about multitasking skills in a high pressure environment, dealing with multiple stakeholders. Borrow the language from business, use that language, and characterize what you actually did. I mean, I have, I, I don't, I avoid malls in general at this point. Well, everybody does. But even before this, um, I wouldn't go near one during Christmas because I had flashbacks. I just couldn't handle it. So, um, you know, it's, it's something that, um, you know, it was, some of these are high pressure situations and you are handling it really well. 
think about how to characterize that in business language to show that you can handle this on top of the fact that you've made it through design school, right? Um, so all, I want to make sure you understand that, that all that experience is relevant. Any volunteer experience that you have is relevant. One, because you're volunteering. It almost doesn't, I mean, whatever you're doing to volunteer your time um, to help people or do whatever, that's valid. Get that in there. Make sure people understand that, that you're prioritizing that as part of how you spend your time. Now, I want to point out, you should all know this, internships should never be volunteer-based. That is not internship. That's you working for free, never work for free. Okay? Um, now, same thing on there. When you're presenting your experience, presenting um, month and year might be appropriate, especially if you have three-month internships or short summer um, gigs, that, that, that's appropriate. Um, if you've been doing freelance, you know, work, you can say, you know, I've been doing freelance work, present that as a block and just put language like I serve a variety of clients, blah, blah, blah. There are a number of ways that you can do that. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, at the bottom, always put a references available upon request. Never give your references unless they out ask for them outright. Like it, if some, some positions will ask for references outright, provide that as a separate piece of paper, unless they instruct you otherwise, right? Or a separate page. Um, the reason that you don't include that, one, is when they ask for references, you know you're getting somewhere, so you know where you are in the process, right? But two, you got to make sure your references are ready. So I, you know, that's the thing is like when you put somebody down for a reference and it's been a year, right? So say you have Professor Pratt as a reference, um, you got to give him a heads up to know a call's coming. And it's also set yourself up for success. If you let your reference know they're going to be expecting a call or an email, let them know what the position is. Let them know maybe what you think they, they could highlight um, that would be helpful in you getting the position. Uh, so always at the bottom, references available upon request. Uh, but then make sure that you check in with your references before you release that list if it's asked for, okay? Also to make sure you have the right contact information for them as well, because people move on, things change. Um, make sure you have all that. Let's see here. Any questions in, on general on cover letter and, and resume? I'm gonna show you, the last time I interviewed for a job was five years ago. Um, and I'm gonna show you what my CV looks like. And now keep in mind, mine is different. Um, because mine's academic. Um, I, my, my CV has to highlight papers I've presented, um, books I've been published in, stuff like that. Um, but this is what I mean by, think about how you organize your information, how you cue them in as to what they're looking at, right? Um, how you present dates and being consistent in how you handle the, the visual language of, do I put a slash here or do I put a dash here? All of that needs to be consistent throughout the document. Don't go back and forth. Um, see, I'm I have to list a lot of, like these are all committees and different responsibilities I've had. Then I have my professional experience um, and affiliations. And then I gotta put all this stuff, right? So it's a little different than yours. Um, but whatever the grouping is, um, think about the quantity of information what is considered maybe most important, um, and then be consistent in how you present that, okay? And then my cover letter was super plain, right? There's no design here. And this is, this is, please take this as, this is by virtue of the nature of the job. I was applying to be the director of the school. So I was not applying for a design position. Um, but I was literally sending this to the professors that taught me typography. So I better make sure this is as good as I could possibly get it, right? So I was scared to death. Um, but all of you should have that fear in you, right? That, that it's like, this should be presented as best as I possibly can. Um, because you never know who's going to be looking at it. You can send it, be thinking an HR person's going to get over, but it could be the principal of the firm that opens up that email. And you immediately get noticed or get noticed for something not so good. So keep that in mind. 
Um, any questions on resume or cover letter stuff? I have a question. Um, yes. When you're looking at, I'm assuming based on what you've presented, that the the balance between the design of your resume and cover letter and the actual content, there's kind of a, a balance between, you don't want to over design and then not worry so much about the content. Can you like, I guess, Kim, what the, the happy medium would be for someone okay. Thank, starting yeah. with? Thank you, thank you, because that's something I forgot. And then when I try to cram all this stuff together, I knew this was gonna happen. So I really appreciate all your questions. You're gonna end up reminding me of stuff. Really think about what is the purpose of each of these objects, right? Your cover letter is a narrative. Um, it's a longer body of type that somebody has to read through. Do you really want to be distracting their eye with a lot of additional design artifacts? I'm not saying in any way make it just plain like mine. Like I have no visual language on there other than a type. That's it, right? But again, that's a different context. And in 150, when you, when you take that class and you're either most likely going to have Marissa or BK um, for that, you're going to be developing your own personal identity in which to present yourself. And that goes into the idea of how do you want to present yourself. Now, what I've seen is some students will let that personal identity run over their cover letter and their resume. Just with any brand identity, there's, there's quantities of it that you can put into any given piece, right? There's, there's a certain amount of the visual language that you can roll into something and some that, that you can very, be very minimal with it, some that you can be very loud with, okay? Now, this is something else you lose in the digital space that's unfortunate is in the physical space, when you have the resume and the cover letter, you have two sides of the piece of paper. So you can flip that piece of paper over and have this bold visual expression of your brand identity, right? And it can fold. And then when I take it out of the envelope, it's like, oh, what's this? Oh, and then I, it, it creates a narrative in that experience. And you're gonna have to do that in that class, even though you might not have a lot of opportunities to share that or send that out, but that's, that's part of it. Now you lose that in a digital space a little bit. But, you know, think about how you can use color. If I'm presented with just this single page PDF, how can I use color? How can I use form to help someone navigate all this information? I think that's the thing there is, your job is to help them navigate this information. And the resume is pretty dense in regards to the amount of information that they have. So don't put anything in there. And I, I usually say this for any design, but don't put anything in there that isn't needed. Like if you're putting down something, if you're putting in a point element or a rule, why is it there, right? And, and if you can't answer that question, get rid of it, get it out of there, right? Because even if you have established a brand and there's other places that shows up like your website or what have you, um, you know, that ha inherently has a color palette. It probably has a quality of line. You know, there's linear elements that you've, you know, chosen or whatever, um, so on and so forth. So keep that in mind. So I want to pause here for a moment, and I don't want anybody to think that we've been Zoom bombed. Um, a close friend of mine who's also a designer from Ohio showed up on the screen. So that is JPhonex. Please don't kick him out, okay? I gave him this simply because we talk about this stuff a lot, and I told him I was doing this, so if he could show up, uh, you know, he could. So hi, Jay. Thank you for joining us. Um, so... Let's keep here. I'll share this again. And it's, again, it's very minimal for chat. What? There's one question in the chat. I don't know if you got it. Oh, that. how far back should you go with experience? That's a good question. I mean, that's the thing is, you know, as students in theory, you don't have a lot of design experience, right? But you may have a lot of retail experience. You may have a lot of other professional experiences. So everybody comes into this differently. I guess where I would cut it off is maybe when does it start to, the type of experience start to break and go into something else, right? You don't want to list every single thing. Like I don't, I actually, there's professional experience I don't have on mine. Um, simply because I've been here almost 20 years, but um, you know, I have all my teaching experience here, but my professional experience I cut off at a certain point. Um, and because it wasn't, wasn't needed. Like I, I at that point, it, it just became um, kind of redundant um, because I kept adding stuff on top of it. 
And, and I think you all kind of reach that point to think, well, is that appropriate anymore? Or does that fit uh, with everything? So, you know, like if you've got, you know, three years of this kind of retail experience and three other years of retail experience, and then you have your first job in there. If also, if you're saying the same thing over and over again, that's another indicator that maybe you can drop the oldest one from the list, right? If you're repeating yourself a lot, that might be a reason to, to drop it. So everybody's different, um, but that's, that's something to consider is when does it get repetitious or when does it seem to not fit within the overall scheme of experience or doesn't add any value you think to what you're trying to, to present to the potential employer, okay? Um, okay, any other questions on resume um, or cover letter? And Alan, did I answer your question okay? You understand Absolutely. what I'm saying? No, that was a killer okay. answer, that was great. Okay. I think I see when you look at the graph design um, resume templates that I showed you earlier, you see a lot of examples of an overwhelming amount of color or overwhelming amount of graphical elements that I'm like, why am I looking at these giant splotches of color? I don't, I don't care. Um, I want to read what this person has done. So, so keep that in mind. Okay. Um, I had a question. Yeah. So I noticed like for some traditional formats for like cover letters and, and resumes, some people have an address at the top for or their own address. Is that even necessary to include anymore in a digital format? I don't think so. I, I, and, I don't, I, and I don't think so from the standpoint of the amount of remote work um, that's potentially going to come into play in the future. I think um, that should be taken out of the equation. Um, you know, if, especially if you know you're applying for a remote position. Um, it's not necessarily something that needs to be included. Um, some digital application processes, though, may request that information. Like if you're filling out form in kind of a CMS scenario for certain HR positions, you're going to have to put a lot of that information in there. But it doesn't necessarily need to be on your resume um, or your cover letter. And if you were physically sending this anyway, you would have it on your return address. I mean, you would have your return address on the envelope just as part of the, that procedure. But in additional space, just make sure you have a clear representation of your email, your website. Um, and if you wish them to contact you via phone, then your phone. Okay. Another point on this, though, is also make sure you thoroughly read the job posting. What are they actually requesting of you? They might request specific contact information or they might request to know where are you are generally located. Um, so make sure you, you read that. Um, that's really, you know, yeah, and I think you could generalize it too. Um, Andrea's, post, post, Andrea's posting at this idea of greater Sacramento or Sacramento, California. Um, you can generalize it as well. Um, but make sure you read the job posting. Any other questions on resume or cover letter? Okay. So now I want to go into, it's kind of a combination of discussing the interview, but also your portfolio. Okay. So you've, um, you put out your digital portfolio, you've applied, um, they've asked you in for an interview or they've asked to set up a zoom interview, right? At this point, your work is satisfactory to the point where they're interested in talking to you further. Your credentials are satisfactory to the point where they're interested in talking to you further. So why do they want to talk to you? What do you think they're going to get out of it? Anybody? Get to know your personality and um, how you can describe your own work, I guess. Yeah, and so that, I think that's that's a two key things there. One, again, you, they're going to potentially work with you for hours on end. They don't. If, if you're really annoying to interview, then sorry, this is not going to happen. Um, but the other part is, how do you talk about your work? right? Because that's what you're going to spend your time talking to them about, right? You're going to be discussing your work. You're going to be discussing their work. How, what language do you use to talk about work? How positive are you? Um, you know, how articulate, how well do you know your work, right? Like how well do you know what's going on in these solutions? Because part of coming out of design school is they're also testing to know whether the work they've seen is yours or it's been heavily directed by us, right? And I, you know, I, I know every one of our professors is different in how they approach things. I know how I approach it. I don't tell you how to do anything. I just constantly ask you questions until you just 
do stuff just to get me to stop asking questions. Um, but, but you need to be articulate about your work and understand your work thoroughly to present that with confidence. Okay. Um, and that's it. I mean, it's like, they, they need to know your process. They need to know how you think they need to know how well you can converse about design because not only are you going to be working with them, but eventually you might be talking to their clients. Right. And they need to know that you can also hold, you know, hold a professional conversation. Um, so this is your opportunity to present your work and it is different now. Most of your interviews over the next six months, maybe years are probably going to be like this. They're probably going to be digital presentations via zoom. And again, I'm going to go back to the beginning. It's like all the experience you have doing that for classes now, take everything you've learned and put it into that to make it the best possible presentation. This is your opportunity to highlight your strengths, acknowledge your weaknesses, share your creative process um, and, and essentially get across what kind of designer you are and what kind of designer you can be for them. Remember who your audience is. Um, there is always, everybody says research who you're, who you're interviewing with. I mean, do that to the point where it's not creepy. Uh, I mean, you can look up the firm, you can look at the, it's different now, right? Like, like I used to just, maybe I looked at the firm's website and, and, that's about all I could get. If I really wanted to start looking at Facebook and Instagram, no, you know, be careful because you don't want to learn something that accidentally comes out of an interview that you really shouldn't have been looking at, uh, maybe about individuals. So do your due diligence, understand the firm, understand who you think their clients are. Um, but, uh, but know, know, know what you need to know going in, but also know, again, this is a professional presentation. Okay. This is not your colleagues, right? These are, and in your internships, like you get more comfortable with talking to your peers and talking with your superiors about things. That comfort level has not been established with these people. And of course, be yourself. Don't be so uptight and rigid that you can't get a word out. But at the same time, you know, think about what's coming out of your mouth. Um, you, part of the success here is knowing what you're going to say about your work and about yourself before you go in. The more you prepare, the more you know, the much easier this is, the much more natural it is um, when you do that, okay? There are going to be things you cannot prepare for, uh, but there are some general ones that you can, okay? Now, know every detail of every project you put in your portfolio. And what that means is not necessarily that you use InDesign. The tools that you're using to a certain extent are irrelevant unless there's something special or you came up with a special process or it's a moment of personal growth that adds to your overall skill set that you're sharing with them as a story. You're using the pieces in your portfolio as a vehicle to share a story about how you've developed and what you can offer as a designer. Okay. So when I say know every detail of a project, understand its context. Um, how would an audience experience the solution? Understand who the audience is. Um, and the goals you are trying to achieve. Now, in your early projects, that might not always fit, right? So for Graph Design 125 and you're doing these identities, usually around museums or something like that, right? It's easy for you to talk about audience, how they would experience it, what the locale is. There's a lot of narrative that can go with that. That's great, right? In type one, a lot of it is abstract and it is form exercises and there is not a lot of real world applications to that. Those, a lot of those projects, honestly, I don't see a lot of them in the final portfolios when we get to the end. Um, I think because of that, because you end up replacing or you have a lot of others that have professional um, or real world context to them. But if they're in there or if they're in, in there for you as a junior, I want you to think about what are you highlighting, right? There you're talking about, this is where I grew my skills in typography. This is me showing my skills in composition. This is, this, there's nothing wrong with showcasing that. Just make sure you know what it is you're saying right? What are you highlighting? And by all means, if you're showing any type work, know what typeface it is. Uh, I don't know. No, you sh that should not be the answer. You should know the type you use. You should, but here's the other thing, and this goes to everything. You should know why. That's what they're trying to get from you. I used this typeface and this color palette and this, this. So what? Why did you use it? Right? Why did it solve the problem? Because that's why you have to understand that overall context of 
you know, who were you speaking to? What were you trying to accomplish? This is how you accomplished it. So that's where the why comes from, right? Especially when you get into your senior year and the projects from those classes are, have a lot more depth in them in, in that area. So make sure that you remember and, and or make something up. Just make it up after the fact. Um, I really, if I'm in a crit wall, especially with seniors and I ask, why'd you do this? And I don't know, I said, make something up. Um, if you don't know, a lot of times it's because you've reached a point where your design skills are starting to synthesize, you know, what it is around you and your understanding and you're making decisions, um, it's becoming second nature to you. And so you, you don't necessarily immediately have an explanation. But that's also why I always say, do not design and analyze at the same time. So when I say make something up, I mean, it's analyze the work and figure out why you did it to solve the problem, right? So you need to know that about every project you put in your portfolio that you're gonna be talking to someone about, right? And I would, I would go a step further to say, if you put it in your digital portfolio, you should be prepared to talk about it even if it's not in your physical portfolio because they've looked at it, they might bring that project up in connection with another point of the conversation. So you need to know about everything that you've put out there. I think the same thing can be said for Graph Design 135 versus Graph Design 130. Two very different things, very different audiences, very different artifacts you produce, very different goals. Showing that depth of understanding of what you did and why you did it is what they're looking for. Okay. Um, any questions on that so far? Make sense? Okay. I want to point this out. And some of these things are things I've just learned or I've heard from students over the years in the, in, in the portfolio class. Your work is not cool. Do not say that it's cool. Do not say any aspect of it is cool. That is not a proper design term. You should not use that in a crit either. But in an interview, do not say that something's cool. I will go further to say that if somebody asks you what your favorite project is, do not tell them this was my favorite project because I got to do whatever I wanted. Can anybody tell me why that's an issue? There were no parameters. So. Yeah, you didn't solve a problem. Um, now, how do you spin that? Because there are some projects where some of the professors let you decide the content, right? Or decide the subject matter or do whatever you want, right? You may really enjoy that project, right? What you say instead is, I really enjoyed that project because I was able to frame the problem. I was allowed to frame the problem and then this is how I solved the problem. Do not say that I, I love it because I could do whatever I want. Because that's a big red flag as I'm going to get a designer straight out of school that just wants to do whatever they want and not pay attention to the brief. Right, Jason's shaking his head yes. Uh, so um, Jason's been practicing this about as long as I have. So uh, longer actually. Uh, so, um, so now I already mentioned this, but I'm going to mention it again because it's very important. Be honest about what you did and did not do in group projects and discuss this with your teams ahead of time. Have that conversation. Um, and actually keep that in mind. So none of you have had 155 yet. None of you have gone into Mion's class where you have teamwork the entire time. I've had some folks come out of that that feel bad that I didn't pull my weight, right? Or I don't get to talk a lot about what I did in that project. Whose fault is that? Make sure you invest yourself in that semester and what it is you're doing in there um, so that you can have a strong piece that comes out of that experience, not only because you contributed, but because you can talk about how you contributed, okay? Um, a lot of students really start off with the question, and this applies, I, I think, the juniors that are going for internships and seniors for internships and potentially jobs, like what order do I put things in and how many put things do I put in there? I think the amount to a certain extent depends on how much you show for each piece, like the what volume you have in your physical portfolio, because a lot of these are gonna be digital. Again, your volume is expanded. Um, but again, it goes back to the idea that can you confidently present each of, this, each of these pieces, right? Can you do that? If you can't, then, it, then it's out. So maybe that means you have, you know, seven pieces and not eight, uh, but really you're gonna to have to self edit to a certain extent. If you tell yourself, I have to have 10 pieces in there, and you're putting 
three not great pieces in there, you're hurting yourself. Don't do that. Okay. The order always start out strong, always end strong. Reason being first impression is important. In the last piece in a physical portfolio, but I imagine this is, this is potential to happen in a digital presentation as well is that's the piece that they're looking at when they're deciding whether or not they want to do a second interview, whether or not they want to hire you or even contemplating how much they want to pay you. So strong start and end a good highlight in the middle would be great. Um, but at the very least, the utmost confidence in what it is you're presenting, the bet most compelling story, um, everything front and back on that one, okay? Um, now, some of, it depends on where maybe you've had internships um, or how the instructors arrange the projects for the classes, but you might have projects that, that are similar and have similar artifacts, a lot of campaigns, right? So anybody that worked in the union, um, you know, might end up having a lot of the same project. You're doing campaigns for events over and over and over again. Um, if you're working for ASI, you have campaigns for, you know, voting or this, that, or the other thing over and over and over again. Um, I think it's important for you to edit those and keep those in mind. Can each one have its own story? Is it the creative process was different or the creative process was different because the subject matter was different? Um, if you end up with a lot of the same stuff, that's where you might group them under a heading of working at ASI or doing this or the other thing. But if you can have truly individual stories about each of these problems, then separate them and, and make sure you remember those stories. Okay. Um, your portfolio is going to can and will evolve over time uh, as you expand your body of work. Once you get more work, or maybe you have a large volume of work now, you can start to tailor your portfolio to who it is you're presenting to. Right? What is the job description? What are they looking for? Um, are the solutions that you're presenting, do they connect with that? Right now, that might be limited with the amount of work that you have, but as you go forward, that's going to change. Okay, now, some things about the, the Q&A aspect of the interview. Remember, you are interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Always have three questions ready for them, at least three. During this process, it's perfectly okay for you to have a notebook. I recommend that you have a small, um, maybe get a field notes thing for, for these, um, you know, a field notes, a small one, like really that you can hold your hand or a small mole skin or something like that, that you can take notes, especially if you know you get nervous, right, in these situations. It's perfectly fine for you to have that to take notes, but then also you can pre-write potential questions to ask them in there that you can reference later, right? So have a notebook with you. Um, don't be afraid to take notes. Um, and then when I say inter you're interviewing as much as that they're interviewing you, there might be opportunities for you to have banter or go back and forth Q and A in, uh, in there. But there's the inner aspect of this. When, you're, when you go to interview, and again, this is something that gets lost in the digital interviews. So keep this in mind when we start having in-person interviews again. Um, but pay attention to your surroundings. I know it's hard. It's very easy to get tunnel vision when you're walking into a giant conference room or someone's office and you're going to do an interview, right? Uh, but pay attention to your surroundings. Do you want to work here? Like, what are the surroundings like? Like, I, I've talked to alumni over the years about their experiences, and there was one shared with me that, that he went in for the interview, and everybody in the office was sitting there, hunched over their desk with their headphones on. It was so silent that you just, there's nothing going on. And he got the job and he went there and he goes, it was maddening. Nobody talked to each other. There was no collaboration. Everybody just sat at their desk and stared at the screen and that was it. Um, and it wasn't what he was looking for. And so, you know, that, that didn't last long. But pay attention to the surroundings. Um, and the questions you can ask can be around like, what is a typical day here like? Um, you know, what, um, how do you, um, you know, how do you organize your time or, um, how you just, how do you assign clients? Um, another, this is a question that you can ask too, is everybody is going to put on their website, the clients that they're most proud of, right? Most firms have bread and butter clients. So these are clients that they have regular work from. It may not be the most fabulous work. And considering that we're in Sacramento state capital, guess who that bread and butter work most likely is? It's the state, right? And it's not that that's bad work, 
Um, but I want you to keep in mind that guess who's going to get the bread and butter work most of the time? The junior designer, right? There's also some other things to consider on that line. So it's okay for you to ask, you know, what, are, what kind of clients do you have that maybe we don't see on the website? Or what kind of, even get making it about the job position, what kind of clients will this position work with, right? Be more specific to the job. Here's the thing is, do you have anybody that you would not work for? Right. So in my, in my like longest stint in my, in my professional studio, um, I did a ton of work for Swisher Sweet Cigars and tobacco. And I did the most insane stuff with processed yellow starburst that you'll ever see. Um, but, you know, um, after a while, I wasn't comfortable with that. Um, and I did not do a good thing in the idea that I specifically tried to make work they didn't like, so I would get off the account, but um, I should have done, handled that more professionally. Uh, when, you're, when you're designing a kayak that sits on top of a rock formation out of Utah that ends up being a stand for smokeless tobacco, I, there's, there's a number of reasons I wanted to walk away from that account, but there are going to be a number of instances in which you can walk into a firm, they can present one thing on their website, and then you might be sitting they're doing work for um, a company or organization that you can't bring yourself to do that, right? And you need to be prepared for that. You need to understand whether that exists for you um, and then not be afraid to ask the question ahead of time. But I think in the long term, you also have to understand how you're gonna deal with that. Um, back, I used to offer, I used to have a project in 145 where I would took, take extreme differences within a particular sector and have students and teams design for those. And, one of them was like I had Starbucks, they had to design for Starbucks and they had to design for local coffee shops, right? And the local coffee shops folks were attacking the Starbucks folks and some people were to Starbucks and got very upset. And that was one example of how that didn't go so well. Um, but then another one was I had large agribusiness and I had small local organic farms. And I had a, I had a student come to me and say, she, she was assigned to the large agribusiness. Like, I can't do this, even if it's fictional, I can't do this. That, that large agribusiness has an adverse effect on my family. Um, and I cannot do that. And I respected that and moved her to the other side of the equation. But these are ethical questions you're gonna have to ask yourself as you go out and you seek out work. So I want you to be prepared for that and not be, if you don't have to bring it up in that kind of, you know, do you have any ethically questionable stuff going on, not on your website, but simple questions of what kind of work will I be doing, I think is a way to start getting in there, okay? Um, I think ask, like looking at the environment and asking kind of where you'll work maybe isn't as much of an issue, but um, I interviewed for an internship one time at a agency in Cleveland. Um, what was uh, Marcus Allen, I think, uh, Jay? Um, and they, they had me walk around and then they showed me where I'd be working. And in the middle of this, this it was in a tall building, in the middle of this floor, there was like a glass cube. Um, and it's where they had dye sublimation printers and copiers and all this stuff. And I could literally smell the chemicals coming out of the space that I'd be working in. I have asthma and allergies. I'm like, no, thank you. Um, and I took an internship out here in California instead. But you, you really have to think about what the fact that you're going to be there. Um, if, if once we get back to in-person stuff, you're going to be there for quite some time. Um, so don't set yourself up for an issue if, if you get a, a bad vibe from that situation right? You don't have to take the first job that's offered to you, um, especially if you know it's not going to be good for your mental or physical health. So keep that in mind. Um, now, I mentioned having a notebook with you, right? Um, to take notes, the questions they ask you, things you want to remember. Um, but right when you're right after you're done and you get out of the building, um, get someplace, write down notes about the experience, right? I want you to take notes. I, this is the same thing I would say after initial client meeting, right? You're taking notes in, in a client meeting, but when you leave, dump everything you can out of your head because you'll forget it. You'll forget it. Um, it was a high stress situation, no matter what. And there's a lot of chemicals going on in your brain from that experience, that flight or fright, fight experience. So make sure you write a bunch of stuff down. The reason being is the next day, do not fail in sending a thank you note. Either personally, you know, typesetting or writing out a thank you note um, and physically sending it in the mail or this day 
and age what we're going through sending an email. But in that thank you note, you should mention something positive that you took from the interview process, right? That grounds you in their memory, like it puts you, it put, pulls from their memory as to that experience. It helps pulls you out from the crowd in that way. Um, and it shows that you're paying attention and you retain stuff. I mean, it's hard to retain that. So make sure that you, you take down notes after you're done, as soon as you're done, as soon as you possibly can. Okay. Um, I've thrown an awful lot at you this evening. What, uh, what questions do you have at this point? Um, I kind of have a overall question. You can kind of shoot it down if it's a bit too, I guess, out of the realm. We're talking about portfolios and, and uh, how to interview for a potential employer, but what about a portfolio that's more oriented towards freelance or towards a more uh, open type of employment where it's maybe more, uh, we'll hire you on for projects and um, like contractual work rather than uh, a nine to five at a firm. Um, is there anything different? Is there any other well, tips you would give somebody? There's, I mean, there's two different things there. So one is if, if you're, if they're hiring you out as a contract, in a way it's, it's very similar, right? The only thing it is they're not, they're not committing. Right. And, and so I think a lot of the same things apply. They, they want to know, even if it's for three months, you know, that a project might be going on, they want to know that you're somebody they want to work with, um, that you're reliable, that you're able to talk about your work. I think all those things apply if they're bringing you on, if you're talking about freelancing with other agencies, right? Like if you're, if you're working with other agencies, all, all the same stuff applies. Now clients going to be different, right? If you're freelancing directly with a client, that conversation is a little different. You know, it goes with the idea of how did they hear about you? How or, or how did you reach out to them? Like, how does that connection made? Depends on how much they know about you. Most likely they've seen your website already. Um, and so it isn't necessarily a matter of um, pitching yourself as a long-term employee, more as a capable professional of getting a project from A to Z, right? And so the language around that, or if you talk about some of your work, like if, if, you're, if you're presenting some of your work, then you focus on the pieces that you can highlight where this is something that goes from A to Z or, or your process of how you solve a problem, right? Because that's part of, if you're setting something up with a client, you need to educate them as to how you work, how it's the payment structure. There's all kinds of things that go with that, right? Um, and so the selling process kind of goes into, this is the body of work we, we've done. This is what we think, this is why we think we're a good fit with you and help you solve your problem, right? So it's a slightly different angle. You still have to have the same knowledge base about your work and why it, there are good solutions, um, but you're, you're selling it in a little bit more direct way um, on that front. Any other questions? I had a question. Sure. Um, when you're discussing your work in an interview, is it, would it be good to discuss the challenges that you have with it? Like the struggles that you have with it? Good question. So let's think about, uh, let's, one, let's think about some quick standard interview questions. What are your strengths? How do you talk about those? What are your weaknesses, right? And that might be something that comes out of um, individual projects or it might be a question they have as part of an interview. When you're talking about your weaknesses, in general, try to spin it in a positive light, right? This is something I've struggled with. These are the steps I've taken to grow in this area. Never leave it as, wow, I suck at this. No, just, you gotta, you gotta build the narrative after that. Now, the, in the projects themselves, and this is what I mean by every project's gonna have something you don't necessarily like, right? I think it's important if you're presenting challenges, think about if you're actually gonna be forthcoming with them, you got to have a positive end to that scenario, right? So even like say team project, this might come up, the idea of how well do you work in a team or how well does the team come together, right? You can say we have some challenges in organizing the team and this is what we did to overcome it and this is how it affected the outcome, right? You got to always have that spin. Otherwise, don't bring it up. Um, and if they bring up, you know, if they bring up something that they don't think is, is working well, you got to take that, um, you got to take that graciously. Right. And you got, you just got to take, the, I mean, uh, we only have one locally. Um, and 
you know, it's probably not going to happen this year, like a, a large portfolio review, right? And But I, I did a lot more of those when I was an undergrad. And I would just have complete assholes, sorry, language, but just come in and just rip me to shreds. And I, I just stood there and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and the thing is, you know, even someone that's, that's maybe rough or, or rude in regards to how they present information to you, I made sure I took what they said. I, I try not to get defensive and I would say, okay, you know what? They're right there. They're, no, they're just an asshole. But, you know, you know I mean, I, I really did a self-analysis of what they were talking about to see, you know, where is the truth in there? Um, but you're going to have folks that point something out to you or they think, here's another one. Did you think about doing it this way? Right? No, you could have a truthful answer of, you know what? I didn't. That's a good suggestion. Easy out. But you very well could have thought of it. Right. That could have been part of your process. Like, yeah, we actually explored that avenue and it didn't work for us for this reason. Um, so that's, again, knowing your projects and knowing your process makes it a lot easier for you to navigate those types of situations. Um, knowing where you perceive the weaknesses to be helps you navigate those situations. So that's where that preparation really helps a lot in really getting a good understanding of each project. Now, something I didn't do that I want to bring back, how you can prepare for that is the fact that you need to write about each project. So here's the difference. Your in-person interview with your physical portfolio, whatever form that takes these days, you are there to talk about your work. You are there to present it. Your web portfolio, you are not, right? So here's the thing. In your physical portfolio, I generally advise you have no writing or very minimal writing. Why? Because you're sitting there with them. They don't, you're not asking them, here, read this book. Otherwise, why did you show up, right? But your web portfolio is an opportunity to show off your writing skill, but outline the problem, the context, the audience, and your solution, right? And potentially show off your process. So, um, so those are two different aspects of our portfolios now that have different purposes, and that's how they've dramatically shifted. But it's also the key moment where you get to showcase your writing skill about your work. So when you write that, now you have already in your head You've worked out what is the core elements of this project I need to share. And in an interview, then you can, you open up about it, right? You use your maybe more natural language, not trying to get it to be concise in writing, but more natural language. You get to tell additional stories about it. It becomes a larger narrative for you. So those, those serve two different purposes. Um, I forgot to, there's a couple other things I want to share and, and let, and um, if anyone, has another question, please shout it out, okay? Um, this is my portfolio. Um, my wife has been uh, telling me for the last six months that I need to redo my portfolio, my physical portfolio in this. And every year when I teach portfolio, I say, I wanna do this with you and I never do because I have too much to do. Since I'm not teaching this spring, maybe I'll redo my portfolio along with all of you uh, next semester. I'll, I'll come join one of your classes and I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll be hanging out in the, in the back. Um, one of the things I wanted to show you again, this is just, this is Adobe portfolio. It's my own URL, right? But it's Adobe portfolio. I just use Behance to run it, but I wanted to show you um, in a way kind of what you can do, but also what not to do. Um, this is a piece I did for the last, or maybe almost the last uh, TBD festival. And so, you know, here's my write-up about the poster and, and things like that. And then here's the final. But when I was making this, I went a little nuts um, in regards to the versions, right? Um, way nuts with the versions. But here is this, this I thought um, is an example. It's okay to show this type of process. So if I go all the way down to the bottom, here's my, here's my sketches, right? Here's my thumbnails. And I jump into digital. And I'm moving along and I'm not happy. And then I go back to my sketches and I realize what I'm missing is something in analog. And so I show what I'm doing. And I, I, bring, I show this because I want you to see that you can show very raw aspects of your process. But this is also to remind you sometimes that when you want to accomplish something in your designs and you spend five hours trying to reproduce it digitally, just get out some tape and some paper, cut it up and scan it in and make it that way. It's a heck of a lot faster, easier and authentic when you do things like, like this at times. 
um, just taking materials that I had in the studio. And then I start to get the texture that I wanted and I start building on that and experimenting with different things, so on and so forth. So I show way too much here. That's, that's a given. Um, no, no, not that one. Um, uh, where is it? No, oh, maybe I took it out. Never mind, I took it out. Um, and then I wanted to show you. So, like I said, I interviewed five years ago, um, and I was asked. Of course, I was asked to share my professional work. Um, and again, this is a different context. I was I was applying to be a director of a school, and so please ignore this. Even though I told you don't put type on there, this is me sending this out through an HR portal at a university. So it, I had to do that. But um, one of the things I want to point out, and this is something I, I won't necessarily get to guide you on, is in these horizontal screw post portfolios, if you do that, you're setting up your grid. Consistency here is key in making sure that your work comes forward. Your gutters and your margins should be as consistent as possible. Build a system, build a grid system that allows that to be consistent because as soon as one of those are off, I'm looking at that white space and I'm no longer looking at your work. It seems like a small thing, but every time somebody has a random gap or something that's inconsistent in their grid structure in these, when they start building it out like this, it becomes an instant distraction. Um, you can play with scale. You can, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do here um, in this structure. But also when you, when you, and again, do as I say, not as I do. Notice here, I have a rule. That's because I have a white edge on that form. And then I have that on some of these as well, because they have a white corner as part of the system. <clears throat> if you put a rule around something, make it a hairline rule, small as you possibly can and still print or be visible, right? So all it's doing is helping to find an edge that is going white to white on the surface. If, I'm gonna say this, if you use drop shadows, and I'm saying this, because I know you will, I know you will, make it, the idea of drop shadows in this context is the same thing, you're trying to define the edge. Make it as small as possible, like we're dropping into three pixels with an offset of one or two pixels. Your work should not be floating off the page. Don't do that. If I see anybody's portfolio that their work is like 25 pixels off the page, I'm gonna come find you after you graduate and I'm gonna start commenting on your Behance or your portfolio constantly yelling at you for drop shadows. Um, you can use it, it could be really effective, but it has to be tiny. You're mimicking paper on paper. And so remember that, okay? Now I wanted to show you this, I was also, Part of this is I have to show student work. And so these are images from student portfolios over the years. And I wanna show you the different ways that people have gone around presenting some of these artifacts. Um, now, some of these are templates. I wanna caution you in the, I, the thing is, because you don't have access to the lighting and the swoop and all the stuff in 166 now, um, using templates to set up three-dimensional uh, mock-ups in your portfolio, I think is perfectly acceptable. What I would caution you on is using the same one over and over and over again for a specific type of artifact. Um, that every brochure looks exactly the same or every multi-page piece looks exactly the same. Look for some variety there to create a sense of authenticity. But as you can see here, there's different approaches to presenting say campaigns or how campaigns then translate to a digital um, representation. Um, some are just very straightforward and flat. Others they're shooting um, you know, the actual objects in different settings, um, thinking about how different narrative pieces or multi, um, you know, impression pieces play out. Um, those are just singles, you know, how to show front and back of something in any given context. Um, and then here, like the idea of putting it in context. Now, the thing is you can mix this up you can have pieces in hand taking photos like that, um, but then also having flat representations, flat digital representations of it to make sure you have a clear representation of the object or the spreads that you're trying to show, right? Um, what I would caution you on is having like one that's treated a particular way and nothing else in the portfolio looks like that, right? If you're gonna mix it up, mix it up, that's fine. 
you're going to stay all one way, stay all one way. But to have like one thing that is presented in a, you know, real world environment, it, it's going to end up standing out kind of an odd way uh, in the overall portfolio. Okay. Any questions on that? We have one question in the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to read it or if you want me to read you it. Um, in terms of content for the online portfolio, what other projects can you add in other than graphic design, photography, illustrations, paintings, et cetera? Good question. So that's what's nice about the online portfolio, right, is that you can segment that out. Um, what I would say, though, is that if you have an additional body of work, right, if you have a larger body of photography, if you have a larger body of illustration, make sure you have enough that warrants that additional section. If it's one piece, maybe not so much, even two, maybe not so much. But if, you if you've taken the time, and this is definitely something that you're presenting as, this is an additional skill set that I have, then get that out there. In your physical portfolio, it might get cumbersome um, to kind of put that at the end or put that at the beginning. What I recommend is simply making another portfolio that you can have available. Okay, uh, on the physical portfolio side, I am in no way saying you have to do this group post portfolio. That's just what people do these days. Um, I'm going to tell BK and, and Marissa, they, do, they can do whatever they want. You can take whatever form you want for this portfolio as long as it presents your work in the best possible light. Um, but if we go with this group post portfolio route, I recommend that you get a case for it to go in one, simply to protect it when you carry it around to interviews. But two, that is a place where you can hold extra resumes, which you should bring, extra business cards, which you should bring. Um, it is also a place where you can then hold three-dimensional pieces. So say you're going through and you get to the brochure for 130 and you want to showcase the physical craft of that, you can have that in there. You pull it out. Here, would you like to see the physical piece? Right? Now, you can only do that with so many pieces, but it's a way for you to um, be able to give them a tactile experience for something if you're in if once we get back to in-person interviews okay um, then you also can put that secondary portfolio in there now if you only have a few pieces right but they're really good pieces and you feel like it's a skill set you want to showcase but you haven't had time to develop it further I actually recommend um, between now and the time you get to that point of developing your portfolio start framing graph design problems that can incorporate that work if it's illustration, come up with a problem in which you can put that illustration in. If you're doing, or painting, or any, anything that, that you're creating an image can end up in an editorial piece um, or in a promotion piece for an event. Um, the uh, same with photography, um, the nature of the photography, the subject matter, what vehicle can you create for it um, that could end up in your portfolio? And then you can, you know, the juniors, you can work with your professors through office hours or, or something like that um to develop that piece over time uh but then the seniors you can actively work with marissa or bk next semester um in in the class on developing that piece and how it fits into your portfolio okay and i would hazard to say even if you do have a larger separate portfolio maybe doing one of those projects to spark the conversation within your interview um would, would be would be potentially a good idea okay um, and in your online portfolio, you're like, you can easily segment that, right? So it's, it's easy for you to do that there. Any other questions? No? I know I left stuff out. Uh, I just tried to cram an entire semester in a, uh, an hour and a half or so. Um, so I'll say this, I mean, you know, some of you, I'm your advisor. A lot of you, I'm not. Um, you know, whether you're juniors or seniors, you are always welcome to make an appointment with me for any reason, right? Um, but I'm happy to look at your work. I'm happy to talk about your portfolio. I'm happy, if you come up with questions after the fact, you can email them to me or you can make an appointment and I'm happy to walk through it with you, okay? I'm always available. Um, and if my office hours don't work for you, um, then let me know and we'll figure out something else, okay? Okay. I really miss talking to all of you. Hey, Professor, I have one quick question for you. Oh, it's kind of off subject a little bit, but 
maybe I'm out of the loop here, but I'm not familiar with Marissa or VK as professors in the design program. Who are they exactly? Oh, my apologies. Um, they taught uh, lower division and, and they've taught upper division. So I didn't know some of you may have had them or not. I, you know, so um, Marissa actually, both of them um, have been helping out to replace my classes over the last three years. Um, you know, when I uh, didn't teach both sections of 145, they both taught that course. Um, and Marissa um, taught the other portfolio course and the other 145 course last year. Uh, and so they'll both be stepping in. Um, both have a tremendous amount of professional experience. Um, and um, actually BK, uh, I think is taught on lynda.com uh, for, I think for quite a bit. So, so I mean, it's like you're, as I said in, in your orientation the last two years at the beginning of the year, pull as much as you can out of them. Um, I think they're, they're really a unique resource. It's, we're fortunate to have them. Um, so make sure you get as much as you possibly can out of them because I, th I think that'll be really valuable. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, any other questions? No? Okay. Well, like I said, I, I really miss talking to all of you. Um, and uh, maybe we can do this again next semester just for fun. Um, Absolutely. You're always welcome. Even if it's not, you know, a you presenting, you can always hop on and, and, and see what we're, we're working on at any given moment. Um, no, this is your time to complain about all of us. I don't want to mess with that. Um, <laughs> there have been some venting sessions. We can't lie, but we appreciate okay, you. Okay. <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time. You're our first guest of the semester. So um, yeah, hopefully this is the start of many more great uh, workshops to come. Thank you. Well, um, I look forward to talking to you again soon. And uh, like I said, uh, reach out if you need to. Uh, send me any questions if you have any. Okay? Okay. Have a good rest of the semester. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks so much.